Welcome to week one of Amazing Grace, an introduction to Reformed theology. Over the next nine weeks, I long for nothing more than for you not only to learn more about what we call Reformed theology, but for you to gain a whole new, fresh perspective on why theology matters and why theology, as it's captured in the Reformed tradition, is one of the most beautiful expressions of theological study. But really, even more than that, just as the name and the title of the series says, Amazing Grace, my prayer is that God's grace and his gospel of grace would be more amazing than ever before. That as you study the Reformed faith and you, re you study Reformed theology, and as we dig into scripture every week, that you would be blown away week after week, and particularly at the end of this nine-week study, and say, God, I never knew how amazing your grace is. I never knew how amazing this gospel is and how amazing you are, that the sovereign God who created the heavens and the earth would actually come down in the person of Jesus Christ and love sinful people like you and like me. You often hear people say, I don't need theology. I just want something that's very practical. I don't need theology or doctrine. I just, I want to feel good about my relationship with God. And often when we think about theology, when we think about studies like this, we think of studies and books and series that are for the highly intellectual. You think of academic settings. You, you think a, a, an intro to Reformed theology should uh, be recorded in uh, a, a library with big books and uh, heady subject matter, not something for the average Christian. Well, I want to tonight and over the course of the next nine weeks, I want to totally throw out that understanding of theology and theological study. I want to throw it out the window and reestablish how we approach theology, particularly how we approach this thing called Reformed theology. And so what I want to do tonight is establish some groundwork, establish some foundational ideas concerning theology and Reformed theology in particular. Now, granted, the reason most people have misconceptions or misunderstandings regarding theology, they think it's for the highly intellectual or for only for academic settings, is most people don't even understand what we mean when we say theology. Theology is simply this. Theology is the study of God. Theology is the study of God. The word theo is short for God, and ology stands for the study or the logic. So when we talk about theology, we're simply talking about the study of God. And so when people say, I have no time for theology, I say, oh, really? You don't have any time for the study of God. Likewise, uh, what would a theologian be? A theologian would be one who studies God. So whether it's theology or you're a theologian, you are concerned with the study of God. That's why R.C. Sproul fam famously said, everyone's a theologian. The question is, are you a good theologian or a bad theologian? Well, let me say a few words of introduction before we dive into this concept of Reformed theology. Um, please understand that the next nine weeks are simply an introduction to Reformed theology. This is not an exhaustive class. This is not an exhaustive study. This is not a seminary level training. This is not by any means going to go through all of the implications and the beauty and the truths of Reformed theology and the Reformed faith but want to give you, whether you're a member of Coral Ridge, a regular attender, or maybe uh, someone who is tuning in via a live stream on crpc.tv, just merely an introduction to the basics of what is known as Reformed theology. But I do want to talk a little bit tonight about those two words, theology and Reformed. 
When we talk about a reformed theology, what in the world are we talking about? Well, we've already established tonight that theology is simply the study of God. But when we talk about theology, we need to distinguish it from other ways of approaching spirituality and faith. Often you hear people talk about spiritual discussions or approaches to faith, and some people call it theological discussions or theological exercises, or some people might call it religious exercises or religious discussions. Well, we need to determine and decipher and distinguish the difference between theology and religion. The difference between theology and religion. What is the difference? Well, both are ways of approaching faith. Both are ways of understanding the spiritual nature of life and the world. The problem is sometimes we use these words as synonymous words, but they're vastly different. Although both are an approach to understanding faith in our lives and faith in this world, theology is a God-centered approach, while religion is a man-centered approach. One says, I will view faith and my life and this world from a God-centered perspective, and another, a religious approach, or the study of religion, is saying, I will understand faith and my life and this world from a man-centered perspective. So we have to understand the difference between theology and religion, a worldview that's shaped first and foremost by God at the center, or a worldview that's shaped first and foremost with man at the center. For instance, if you go to a university or a college, you'll notice maybe the difference between theological studies and religious studies. Some people think they're one and the same. One approaches life and world through the lens of God. Another approaches religion through the lens of of man. But may, let me be very clear that historic Christianity has always approached the world and approached life and approached faith from a theological or theocentric or God-centered perspective. So when we talk about theology in any regard, we are saying we're starting first and foremost with God at the center. We are not concerned with starting with man. We want to study man. We want to study the world. We want to study life, but all through the lens and the eyes of God. So when we talk about Reformed theology, we're talking about a faith expression, a faith tradition that has God at the very center. It's also um, worth mentioning that theology, for as many people that try to dismiss it nowadays and only being for the, those that are highly intellectual or theology is just for uh, the academics or for academic settings, about 100 years ago, anybody that went to university um, had to study theology. Theology at one time was called the queen of the sciences, so whether you were a doctor, whether you were a lawyer, whether you were a teacher, whatever your vocation was, you had to study theology because the university system understood that theology will have to be the lens in which you interpret all of life. So regardless of your profession, regardless of your calling, regardless of your major, everyone had to have take classes in theology because they believed that God was the source of all truth. And so the educational system throughout the world, at least through the Western world, wanted the Bible and God to shape every student's understanding of life and the world. And we need to remember in this day and age when people are dismissing studying God and the knowledge of God, it's returning our families, returning our lives, returning our churches back to the importance of theology because there's no greater knowledge that, than we, that we need in life and in the world than understanding God. I think it's also important to remember that the reason we study theology and we have a God-shaped view of life and the world and that we approach faith and spiritual matters from a theological perspective is this reason here, 
actions follow beliefs. Actions follow beliefs. You see, we just don't wake up every day and just act. We don't just wake up every day and go and do something without thought, without conscience. You see, it's our beliefs. It's our doctrine. It's what we believe concerning life and God and the world that then moves us to act upon it. And so if our actions follow our beliefs, what we believe is of the utmost importance. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, says what? Be transformed. Your actions, your life, your what you do physically, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's why we need a God-centered approach to life, to knowledge, to this world, because our actions follow our beliefs. Another passage I'll give you, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Paul, the apostle, says to a young Timothy, he says, watch your life and your teachings closely. And what he does there is he combines actions, life, your lifestyle, what you do, with what you believe, your doctrine, your teachings. You see, Paul teaches all throughout the New Testament that you can't disconnect your actions from your beliefs. That's why we need to understand theology and why we need to have a good theology. Remember what R.C. Sproul said, everyone's a theologian. The question is, are you a good one or are you, are you a bad one? Because your theology, your view and understanding about God in relation to faith, this world, and life will determine ultimately your actions in life. This is why we study theology. Now let's switch gears. We've talked about theology and why this is important and why this might be some of the most practical things that we study, the things concerning God, the study of God being the most practical thing that we study as believers. But what do we mean by reformed theology? And that's what I want to unpack for us for the rest of our time tonight. When we say reformed, we've established what we mean by theology, but what do we mean when we say the word reformed? Now, we need to remember that reformed is one of several branches of the Protestant Christian faith. Out of the Protestant Reformation, there were many branches of theological expression, many expressions of faith. So when we say Reformed theology, this is an expression of faith, one of many Protestant, um, Protestant expressions that came out of that period of time. As I said, the Reformed theology comes from uh, the system of teaching during the 16th century Protestant Reformation. We're not going to go into a lot about the Protestant Reformation tonight and probably not a lot throughout this series, uh, but understand we will touch on some of the highlights of the Reformation, but we're not necessarily talking about the historical movement in the 16th century led by Martin Luther and others. We're primarily talking about the theological expression or the expression of faith that came out of that historical movement. Uh, movement, but it's important to understand historically where did this movement come. I do think what's important to remember is this this key word, reformed. Just as the Reformation did not set out to develop a whole new church, their idea was to reform the church against the abusive practices of the current church globally. The same goes for Reformed theology. The Reformed theology and the Reformed theological expression that came out of the Protestant, uh, the 16th century Protestant Reformation, that the theology did not attempt to come up with a brand new theology. It did not attempt to come up with a whole new theological expression concerning God and concerning the world and concerning life. It simply intended to go back and reform, not form something new, but reform what was established already by God through 
his scripture. So their whole intent was to go back and say, against the abuses in the church currently, how do we go back to what scripture says? How do we go back to the only rule of faith and practice? So understand that the Reformed theology that came out of the Protestant Reformation had similarly the same goal, not to form something new, but simply reform it. The Reformation wanted to reform the church. Reformed theology attempts to reform our theological expression to make sure it is closely in line uh, uh, according to the Old and New Testaments. So what do we mean then? What is distinct about Reformed theology? And what are going to be some of the things that we talk about in the course of this series, Amazing Grace? What makes Reformed theology Reformed? Well, we've already talked about where it came out of. It came out of the Protestant Reformation. But what are some of the distinctive trademarks that make Reformed theology Reformed? The first is this, an emphasis on the sovereignty of God. Remember I said that theology is a God-centered approach to faith? Well, you could argue that Reformed theology is a hyper-sensitive, uh, God-centered approach to theology. That it is making sure that everyone understands that as we approach God and this world, life and faith, that God is at the center of it all. That God is sovereign over all creation and all things in it. Now, understand that most faith expressions, most Christians would adhere to the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. But here's the problem and here's the difference. Many would say it's one of many doctrines. It's one of many teachings. Reformed theology says it is the central, foundational, fundamental teaching. It is the doctrine that informs all other doctrines. It's the character of God that defines all other characters. That we interpret, for instance, the freedom of man that we'll talk about in later weeks. Or we interpret evangelism, or the scriptures, or the way God acts, or how creation happened, or what the goal of humanity is, all through the lens of the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. In Reformed theology, God is exalted. His sovereignty and his control over all things is preeminent. It is not just a truth concerning the character and nature of God, but it is the defining truth in Reformed theology. The next distinctive is this. Justification by faith alone. Justification by faith alone. It was in the 16th century that when the Protestant Reformation was launched, that the church at the time, the universal church at the time, was teaching that you are justified, that you are made right with God through faith, and by works. So the cry that came out of the Reformation and embedded itself into Reformed theology was this all-important teaching that the just shall live by faith alone. You see, Reformed theology is a recovery of the gospel that the good news declared by Jesus and then passed down throughout church history is one message that God saves sinners through Jesus Christ. His perfect life, his death, and his resurrection secured for all who believe in him and in him alone salvation forever and ever. The just shall live by faith alone. So another distinctive of Reformed theology is the recovery of the gospel message that the just shall live by faith alone. You could add it on to this, and we'll talk about this more in detail in the next few weeks, that the just shall live by faith alone, uh, by grace alone, to, through Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. But it was that idea of the alones of the gospel, Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone, that 
an individual can be made right, can be justified in the sight of God. This and this alone is the gospel. So we have the distinctive of the sovereignty of God. We have the distinction of justification by faith alone. We also have the authority, the authority of scripture is another distinctive of reform theology. Out of the Reformation, the Protestant reformers said, no, it is not the words of a mere mortal. It is not the Pope or the cardinals or the priest. Uh, it is not the upper class or the religious elites that speak for God, that the word of God and the word of God alone is our only rule of faith and practice. It's not the Pope. It is not church tradition and the Bible making up our rule of faith and practice. It is the word of God alone. Out of Reformed theology, we hear the battle cry, script, uh, sola scriptura, scripture alone. Scripture would be our only means for understanding who God is, who we are, how the world was created, and how we are to function in the world. The scripture alone would tell us how the church is to operate. Scripture alone would tell us how humanity can have a saving relationship with Christ. So it was a return to the authority of scripture. And in a few weeks, we'll unpack the importance and the preeminence of God's word in Reformed theology. Reformed, the Reformed theology is also covenantal. It's also coven, how do you spell that? Covenantal, there we go. Covenantal with, a, with an E there. Reformed theology is covenantal. What do we mean when we say Reformed theology is covenantal? We believe that there is one covenant of grace established in Genesis and seen all throughout the scriptures, finally fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus Christ, and that covenant being uh, consummated in the coming of the kingdom of God in Revelation. But we believe that there's a unity in the story of redemption from Genesis to Revelation. We don't read the storyline of the Bible in bits and pieces. We don't read the characters and the themes and the narratives in parts, but it is a whole. And we believe in the what is known as covenant theology. We believe that we are a covenantal people that the way people got saved in the Old Testament is the same way the people in the New Testament get saved. The Old Testament saints look forward to the promised Messiah in faith and the saints in the New Testament, Christians, we look back to the finished work of Christ in faith for our salvation. But Reformed theology is covenantal. And then lastly, Reformed theology, a distinctive, is the distinctive of the lordship of Christ. That Christ is Lord over all. That Christ is Lord over every person, over everything. That if God is sovereign, then he has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to be the king of kings and lord of lords. And we'll talk about the lordship of Christ. And when we think about the kingdom of God coming on earth as it is in heaven and how Christian believers participate with God in what is known as the priesthood of all believers, making Christ preeminent in every sphere, in every domain, in every aspect of our world and in our culture, we see the lordship of Christ. So when we talk about a reformed theology, we are saying that this is a theology that emphasizes the sovereignty of God justification by faith alone. This is the essence of the gospel. The authority of scripture, a theology that is covenantal, one story from beginning to end, and emphasis on the lordship of Christ, that Christ is preeminent. He is the perfect prophet, priest, and king. So we've established tonight, why, what is theology and why is it important? We've established tonight, what do we mean by Reformed? So when we talk about an introduction to Reformed theology, we have an understanding of some of the distinctives that we're going to cover the next few weeks. But I want to end on this note, with a little bit of application. Because you might be sitting there at home saying, okay, 
you've convinced me about theology, why it's important to study of God. I can buy into that. Okay, you've given me, maybe enlightened me to what we mean by a reformed theology. What are the reformed distinctions? But you might still be sitting there and saying, but what difference does it make? I have real problems and real issues. I have marital problems. I have problems with my children. I have other relational issues. I'm struggling with school, with work, with finances, struggling with mental illness, struggling with being towards the end of my life and fearing death. I'm, fear, I'm struggling with disease. Maybe you're struggling with identity and purpose and you're going, how in the world does a, a study on reformed theology change anything or make any difference in my life? I want to give you a few, few practical implications of why we study and the importance of reformed theology. The first is this. The first practical implication is this. Humility. I can't think of another theological expression. I can't think of another understanding of who God is and how God works other than a theology that exalts God, the sovereignty of God, and humbles humanity. I often say that as Christians, we need to have a high theology and a low anthropology, a high study and understanding of God and a low anthropology, a low study of man. You see, there's no way we can live with the biblical character trait and principle of humility if we have a low view of God, that God's not really in control of all things, and we have an elevated view of of man. Reformed theology, in my opinion, highly exalts God and humbles humanity to its rightful place. So if we want to pursue humility, as I know you do, as a Christian and as a believer, Reformed theology, the implication of humility. The second implication is this. It creates a spirit of gratitude if you're new to this understanding of Reformed theology, you're going to begin to see in the next few weeks how salvation works according to the scriptures. How a sovereign God, perfectly pure, perfectly holy, perfectly sovereign, actually pursued sinful humanity like you and me so that we might be saved. Remember what Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, While we were yet sinners... He died for us. Christ died for us. We see the love, the love and the unconditional favor that God has for sinners like us. That God came and rescued us. And according to his sovereign will and according to his sovereign grace, wrestled us out while we were yet sinners, while we weren't pursuing God, while we were dead in our trespasses, God sovereignly loved us. It's, I can't think of another expression of faith, another study of God that would drive us to our knees in thanksgiving and gratitude and make us cry out as this study is called, God, your grace is truly amazing. It produces gratitude. The other thing it does is it gives us confidence. Confidence in what? Confidence in God and his word. You see, when we study Reformed theology and we understand the importance that it puts on the authority of Scripture, it gives us confidence that it's not riding on our shoulders to fix people, to fix ourselves, to get somebody saved. We simply have to be faithful in our declaration of the good news. We simply have to be faithful in what we teach concerning the Scriptures and what we communicate, but we leave it all up to God. Realizing that he's sovereign. He's sovereign over all. It also gives us confidence in the trustworthiness of the scriptures. Reformed theology reminds us that the scriptures are trustworthy and reliable. We don't need anything else. We don't need winsome words. We don't need to, uh, to have eloquent speech. We don't have to be the smartest person on the planet. We can allow the word of God speak for us because it is living and active. Look what else. Paul says about the scriptures. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, he says, all scriptures breathed out by God. It means all scriptures inspired. It's authoritative. 
And it's breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Verse 17, that the man of God might be complete for every good work. What a great promise we have uh, regarding uh, the word of God. And so it produces humility. It produces gratitude for God's salvation in our life. It gives us confidence in God and in the authority of scriptures. The scriptures are the final word. We don't need to add anything to it. Um, it's trustworthy and it's reliable. Reformed theology will also help produce a spirit of peace. Why? Romans 8, 28. Now we know in all things, God works all things together for the good, for those that love him and are called according to his purpose. If God's not sovereign, then we have so much to fear. But if God is sovereign and in complete control of everything, as Reformed theology teaches us and drives us back to this all-important central foundational doctrine of the sovereignty of God, what else is going to produce a peace, as Paul says, that passes all understanding, understanding that God is governing all things for the good of his people, even on your worst day, even in those circumstances and trials in your life where you go, this is a bad thing. For those that know Jesus, those that are called according to his purpose, God is even working through those seemingly devastating issues and circumstances in your life. God is sovereignly at work and is the only way we can have peace. It also gives us assurance. It gives us an assurance. Assurance of our salvation. Assurance that if God is sovereign over all, that nothing can, as Jesus say, take you out of my Father's hand. Another passage is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. It says that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. What does that mean? The author of Hebrews is saying, Jesus is not just the beginning of your salvation, but he's the end of your salvation as well. The same Jesus that saved you and brought you into relationship with God, the Father, is the same God, is the same Jesus that will keep you. It gives us the hope of eternal assurance. It gives us the hope that once we are saved, we are always saved. I couldn't do anything to contribute to my salvation. It was all up to the sovereignty of God but I can't do anything to lose my salvation. God is sovereignly at work in my salvation from the beginning to the end. It also gives us hope in our prayer lives. What would motivate me to pray if I don't believe that God is sovereign over all things? If God, I often hear people say, if God's sovereign, why bother praying? I say, if God isn't sovereign, why pray? Why would I pray to a God that it might be beyond his control to fix it? Why would, why would I pray to a God that there might be certain circumstances or situations in my life or your life that are beyond the capacity of his control? No, it's because I believe that God is sovereign, that it drives me to prayer and it gives me hope in my prayer life, that I am praying to a God that not only hears me and listens, but has the power and the capacity to do something about it that he has the, the power and the ability to be on the move. This is what it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 27. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The Spirit of God, the sovereign Spirit of God, it says, intercedes, for, intercedes on behalf of the saints to do what? To according to the will of God. Of God. So in our prayer life, we believe that the sovereign spirit is actually going in between us, taking our words, taking our prayers, taking our requests, and interceding according to the sovereign will of God. Without this theology, without these teachings, it gives me no hope in prayer. And then lastly, the last implication is it gives me and you motivations for evangelism and missions. Same principle as prayer. If, if God is not in control of all things, how do I know anyone will actually come to faith? How do I know and how can I trust the, the authority of Scripture and the reliability of the Scripture 
if it's all riding on me. No, actually what motivates me for evangelism and missions is that I believe that God, and we'll learn this uh, more um, in, in a larger capacity in the next few weeks, more clearer understanding, but we'll, we'll be able to see that if God is sovereign, that he not only ordains the end, what will come to pass, but he ordains the means to those ends as well. God has ordained for men and women to come to faith, but he has also ordained us, the church, to go out as witnesses, to share the gospel in both evangelism and in local and international missions. Now, if if I don't believe that God is sovereign, what, it, it doesn't give me much motivation. But the fact that God is sovereign and that he's at work ordaining the ends and the means, this is what moves me and motivates me. If, if I didn't believe that there was a, uh, an ordained uh, group of people that were called to come to faith according to the will of God and according to a certain appointed time, I might wonder is all this evangelism and missions just a waste of time? No, the fact that I know that God's already ordained those ends, that there would be certain men and women out there in the world that need to come to a saving relationship uh, with God, and that God has ordained me to be that means, to be that mouthpiece, to be faithful in ministering to those both locally and abroad in missions. It's what gives me motivation. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 says what? Jesus looks at Peter and says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. You see, there's a sense of confidence in Jesus' words. I will build my church. There's this idea of sovereignty. There's this idea of the sovereign king of the universe saying, not I will try to build my church. I will build my church. So knowing that, knowing that that is the end of the sovereign king of the world, to build his church, and he says the gates of hell will not prevail if God isn't sovereign. And we don't know if he'll actually build his church. We don't know if those, his plans will actually come to fruition. Then that doesn't give me a lot of motivation, does it? But it's the fact that the sovereign head of the church, the one who sits at the right hand of God the Father, sovereignly speaks and says with confidence, I will build my church and nothing Nothing will stop it, not even the gates of hell. So humility, gratitude, confidence, peace, assurance, prayer, evangelism, and missions, all practical implications for why we study and why it's important to understand Reformed theology. Let me leave you with this. My seminary professor who taught me so much about systematic theology and taught me so much about Reformed theology in particular, Robert Raymond, often in the middle of his class would close the textbook and with tears on, in his eyes, look at us, his students, and say, if this does not move you to weep, you have missed the heart of Reformed theology. If there is nothing more that comes about because of this study together, I pray that it would move you to worship God. Not just worship on a Sunday morning, but worship God in every facet of your life. That you would be draw, brought to your knees and say, God, I never knew you were that glorious. I never knew you were that sovereign. I never knew you were that great that it would elevate and exalt God in your life and in your walk with him more than ever before. And it would bring you to your knees and understand, God, I am nothing without you. And it would cause you to glorify him and worship him in everything you say and everything you do. I want nothing more than for men and women, youth, boys and girls, when they are captured by this thing called Reformed Theology, that would drive them to the ground to exalt their God, to worship, to sit at his feet and simply weep and say, God, your grace is truly amazing. Would you pray with me? Our Father and our God, Lord, I thank you for this beautiful truth that we call Reformed theology. 
Lord, I pray that this would not just be another exercise of gaining more knowledge. I pray that we would look beyond maybe some of the uh, maybe, maybe some of the misconceptions we've had about theological study or about Reformed theology in particular, and we would begin to understand that this is about knowing you. This is about knowing God, that, that God, I am a theologian, and I, I need to have the right thoughts concerning you because the way I think and the way I believe changes the way I live and changes the way I respond. So I pray that I would be transformed by the renewing of my mind. And Lord, I pray that it would translate into humility, gratitude, peace. It would give me a motivation knowing that the sovereign God of the universe has called me to co-labor along with him in this great work of salvation, in this great work of expanding the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. But Lord, Lord, I pray that this would humble me to the point where I exalt you instead of exalting myself. Lord, in those places in my life where you need to be preeminent, in those places in my life where you need to be more exalted, Lord, would you have your way with me? Lord, would you use this study for all of us to put you back on your rightful place in our lives and to put me in my rightful place as your creation, as your child, as your son and as your daughter, And may I be overwhelmed with awe and wonder. And may this study of Reformed theology make me weep and make me worship and make me cry out, truly, your gospel is a message of amazing grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us for week one of Amazing Grace. Hope that you will join us next week for week two of Amazing Grace, an introduction to Reformed theology.